Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, A CFO's Model for Nonprofit Board Governance. If you're attending the webinar to receive California CE credit, please note that if you meet the requirements, which I'll go over in just a moment, you will receive an email within three business days with access to your certificate of completion. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. You can maximize or minimize the webinar pane during the presentation by using the red arrow buttons. During the webinar, we also encourage you to ask questions. You'll see a chat box that you can use to enter those questions. Just type the question and click Submit. Our presenters will answer those questions as time allows, either during the presentation or at the Q&A session toward the end. Second, to ensure good audio quality, please check your settings. If you're using a telephone, please click on the Use Telephone Audio Mode. Or if you're listening through your computer, then please click on the Use Mic and Speakers option. Now I'd like to present a few quick CE requirements. As a reminder, to qualify for California CE, you must use a personal computer, no PDAs, and log in with your own information and unique URL. You must be logged into the online software for at least 50 consecutive minutes within the scheduled time frame of the webinar. You must actively respond to at least 75% of the polling questions. There will be four, which means you need to answer three, and you must complete the evaluation survey at the end of the webinar. And now a quick introduction uh, to our speakers. You've got Dean Cuyambo. He's a partner with our firm. More than 12 years of experience as an auditor. He then transitioned to our chief relationship builder. Uh, Dean helps numerous private schools, social service organizations, performing arts organizations, and faith-based institutions address their tax, audit, and outsourced accounting needs. Boards, finance, and audit committees have gra grasped his laser focus on bringing to life the audit items that matter most including his proven method of benchmarking data and key financial operating ratios. And we'd like to welcome a very good friend of the firm, Marilyn Gardner. She's a nonprofit industry veteran. She has more than 14 years of experience as the CFO of a nonprofit, formerly serving as the CFO of De La Salle High School. During her tenure, the school's balance sheet more than doubled. She currently sits on the board of directors for John Muir Health and is a member of the Audit and Compliance Committee. During her tenure there, the board has approved more than four um, $1.4 in capital improvements. Uh, she's also currently a project manager for De La Salle High School's Stream Innovation Center, a 28,000 square foot, 20.5 million science, technology, robotics, engineering, arts, and math center. And with that, a quick review of our learning objectives. So during today's webinar, participants will clarify how to help the board direct versus do review the importance of the CFO's role in educating the board on key financial metrics and other items, and we'll identify what CFOs can do today to start making an impact on their board tomorrow. And with that, I will turn it over to Dean. All right. Thanks so much. So today in our webinar, we'll go over uh, board governance, um, the CFO impact to your nonprofit, uh, the board's impact to your nonprofit, and we'll do a summary as well. All right, so we'll start off with a polling question to make sure that everybody gets one right under their belt. Uh, number one is, how well do you know your organization's board governance policy? Um, A, extremely well, B, well enough, C, not well, D, not at all. Obviously, there's, there's no right answer or wrong answer here. I'm just trying to level set um, the conversation. So we'll give everybody just a couple minutes couple seconds, I should say, to, to answer that question. And as we anticipated, 40, 45% are saying, well enough. And that's probably, what would you think, Marilyn? Is that pretty consistent with what you think you would, you would see? Or I would see? think so. If you're, if you're, depending on what your position is, I, I would think you would have, if you're in, some sort of senior management uh, position, you would know what how your board governance policy works, and uh, yes, it's critical to your position in the organization. Sounds good. If you're one of those that answered not at all, let's definitely get you involved uh, in your board governance, um, and hopefully today will help you out. So with that said, board governance, the importance of uh, protecting your nonprofit. We wanted to level set the conversation and kind of bring everybody back to the three pillars of board governance that are common within nonprofits. And that's the duty of care, 
the duty of loyalty, and the duty of obedience. Go ahead. Really, it's it's uh, the pillars of board governance for nonprofits and for uh, for profits. Uh, if you even the biggest of corporations should have these same duties of care, loyalty, and obedience. The duty of care is really the uh, prudent use of assets, and that's not just the facilities and and hard assets, but the people and goodwill of the organization, and uh, the board has its uh, fiduciary responsibility for overseeing that. The duty of loyalty uh, is that the board has makes decisions in the best interest of the nonprofit, not in the board, in, board members' uh, self-interest, and that's a really critical piece, and any uh, properly organized uh, and governed organization would require conflicts of interest uh, statements to be filed by all board members uh, and senior management, really, uh, that, that their uh, duty of loyalty is to the organization first. The duty of obedience is that the board is to ensure that the nonprofit obeys all applicable laws and acts in accordance with ethical pra practices and that the nonprofit adheres to its stated corporate purposes and advances its mission. And I think the last piece is really critical, that you're, as a board member, acting to advance that organization's mission. And you should know that mission and make keep that in mind with all decisions. Great. Thanks, Marilyn. With regards to duty of loyalty, you had mentioned conflict of interest um, policy and, and statements. Is that something that in your time um, working with nonprofits as both the CFO and as the audit committee chair, that routine practice that everyone was required to sign conflict of interest statements? We do now, not at the beginning, <clears throat> with, with, at least with De La Salle High School. We certainly do require that of our board members, and uh, I think that's really important. With respect to John Muir Health, um, I sign every year a conflict of interest uh, statement that's, uh, I would say, at least 15 pages long uh, in terms of questions and then uh, documents that I have to sign saying that I'm loyal to uh, jump your health and not to my personal, um, that I don't have personal interest in, in the organization. Great, great. This next slide set is talking about board composition and um, <laughs> composition of skills and, and composition of, of diversity. I know that, that that's a big topic these days is trying to make sure that the nonprofit board of, of every organization is really has all the people, all the right people in the right seats, Marilyn. Uh, I think skills, uh, diversity of skills, diversity of uh, backgrounds, I think all of that is really critical. I think a new, not a new uh, skill, but one that sure should be considered as you're uh, looking to have a well-rounded uh, board is that you have someone that at least one person there that and maybe several that have a, a knowledge of the community that that organization serves and that's really critical so that they can bring that that's again touching back to that alignment with our mission yeah I, I think that's that can be challenging I mean I know that, you know, boards work through, you know, nominating or governance communities. How, in, in your um, experience, Marilyn, have you or the boards that you've been a part of um, actively tried to make sure that the board is actually representative of the community that you're helping? What have you guys done? Um, say, for example, at De La Salle, um, you know, I know that you have a, a mission or, or there's a mission at De La Salle to um, – uh, enroll students that are below the poverty line. How did you guys go ahead and ensure that there's board representation for those students? Uh, I think uh, currently sitting on the board is a member of um, uh, an executive director of an organization that serves the very same constituency, and uh, I think that's important. Uh, it is incredibly hard to find uh, board members with the skills that you need, particularly in the financial and audit area and um, 
strategic thinkers uh, that are also members of the community that you serve and, and trying to find that diversity is difficult, but it can be uh, attained through, again, somebody that serves that same constituency. Right. So actively seeking out people. It's it's a cons. I think it, it should be something that you have a uh, quote unquote stable of, of uh, prospective board members that you can reach out to that you would uh, ask to be a member of the board when that particular skill is coming up as as people roll off right. the board. And, and Marilyn, a question for you. Who is kind of continuously looking at the board composition saying, you know, we, we could really use one of these blank, fill in the blank. Is that is that the, the um, executive director's role? Is that the board chair's role? Who, who's doing that? Or is that combined together? That's combined together. I think uh, at Dulles Hall High School, we have a uh, nominations committee and between the nominations committee and the CEO or president, um, I think that's where that function lies. Uh, John Muir Health, we have a governance committee, but certainly the uh, chief executive officer is, is in search of those board members as well. Great, great. Okay. Well, now we now that we've talked about um, the pillars of, of governance for the board, and then we've talked about um, the skill sets of the board, we want to kind of transition to what boards typically do and how they typically manage, and what is really best practice with regards to board governance. Um, and, and Marilyn, you and I had a conversation about this, is that um, you said that what boards should not be doing is doing the how to execute tasks. Um, but what they should be doing is providing some direction. Why don't you kind of provide some insight on that? Well, I, th I think boards, rather than, if I can use the uh, ship as a metaphor, uh, rather than steering that ship uh, by managing day-to-day -day operations, the board is, is providing the foresight, the the guidance in terms of where that organization should be moving, uh, the oversight in in the uh, execution of that strategic plan, and the insight into uh, uh, from that experience that those board members bring to that organization, insight into ways of looking at uh, uh, those strategic directions. So I, I think they. The board is really critical at being the advocates of that mission and to steer that ship, if I can overuse that metaphor, in the direction that it needs to go in, but not how to do that on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, the board is responsible for sound ethical and, and legal governance and financial oversight, but the board should not be involved in how to perform that. That is up to the CEO and his team, the CFO to uh, perform. And, and but we, we know, I, I'm sure that there's a lot of people out there listening to this webinar that says, yeah, you're, I would love it if my board was giving a lot of insight. How, how do we how do we get boards out of our underwear drawer per se and stop having them tell us how to do everything, but literally just, you know, help manage? Well, from the beginning, I, and we're going to have a slide on this, I think, is, is educating the board and their responsibilities. And that's, critical and there should be an ongoing education of the board for that. But it's up to the CEO, not the CFO, uh, certainly to, to push back and say, wait a minute, give us the direction, the strategic direction uh, is fine to make those decisions, but not to get into our under proverbial underwear drawer and tell us how to do it. <laughs> exactly. We, we've uh, we've entrusted the senior level of management that, that they're going to do the right decisions. Correct. And if and if the board sees that the CEO is not performing in the way they need it, that that feedback needs to come back to the CEO. But the CEO has to manage the board too. Yeah. Oh, great. And that's a great transition to our next slide. Is how does you know the, when we're talking about the CEO and skill set that senior management needs to have um, to be able to have a good relationship with boards. Um, you know, for that CEO and executive director, that right CEO, they, they've got to have it figured out. They've got to know how to manage the board, and they've got to be able to discuss any concerns. The CEO is the only 
employee of the board. And so it is, that's the relationship, the CEO to the board. It's not that the board can't come to the CFO and that, that puts the CFO a little t- sometimes into a dual re- reporting responsibility. The CFO should be in complete harmony with the CEO. They work together. They work together on uh, how they want to report to the board. They work together on uh, the CFO should always be providing the CEO with drafts of any reports going out to the board before they go out. They've got to be in, in total agreement with that protocol for board, uh, board reporting. But at the same time, if the board comes to the CFO and asks for information, the CFO needs to be transparent, as does the CEO, with the, with the board and provide plain, true, and complete disclosure to the board. Um, if not, we, you can't expect the board to make good wise decisions for the organization. Uh, The CFO is there to emphasize key points, explain risks associated with a course of action, and it is up to the board to make the decision based on that. Um, But the board can't make those decisions without those facts and key points explained and what the risks and and the uh, up and down on on a contemplated action. but the board needs to stay at the level of the strategic and, and uh, the upper level, 30,000 foot level of these decisions. And so it, it's up to the CEO to manage the board if they start getting into that underwear drawer. <laughs> right. Now, that's, that's a great point. And that is, that is the balance of the relationship, it yeah. sounds like. I think it's important that the CFO keep the CEO informed of any uh contacts by the board. If the board's asking for information, be transparent with the CEO and say, you know, the board's asking me for this information. I'm providing this. Is this so, you know, that sort of thing. But at the same time, the CFO definitely does have a dual reporting responsibility. Got it. Got it. That's, that's very good insight, Marilyn. Okay. So we'll get to another polling question. Um, Which is not one of the three pillars of board governance. Uh, Loyalty, trust, care, obedience, or not sure. And Dean, let me jump in here while people are uh, answering the question. And we've gotten a few questions about if you'll receive copies of the slides after the presentation. The answer is, of course, yes. Um, You'll be receiving an email um, probably tomorrow, um, if not later today, depending on when we get the recording. So rest assured, you'll get the slides. You'll be able to replay uh, the conversation. Some would like to um, perhaps share the presentation with their board, which I don't know if anybody would want to comment on that, but that seems like a good idea to me. I think any time that you're uh, entertaining uh, some education for the board, for the CEO, for the CFO to understand proper board governance, I think it's critical for the organization. It can only improve the governance of that organization. Right, it can only help. It can only help. Okay, um, so the answer to our polling question, which is not one of the three pillars of board governance, I mean, the overwhelming answer was B, trust, uh, was 54%. The interesting thing about that is that, you know, as, as an auditor, as a CPA, um, it's something that we always talk about with our clients, and that is trust is not a control. Right. It's not something that you could you can count on because you just don't know what's going to be going on uh, long term. So um, just want to touch on that. All right. Let's talk about CFO impact and how to better the CFO's role. Um, so first off, Marilyn, we, we did want to say and, and, you know, we have come across some CFOs that, you know, they don't attend all board meetings and they're not in the right conversations. So we wanted to talk about both from your role as a CFO, and you'll also see here as, as critical for the audit committee chair, but um, just what are the right conversations that a CFO should be having? Well, definitely board, I mean, CFOs should attend all board meetings. I, I think they're part of senior management. Um, I know it's true at Dulles Hall that they do. Um, and it's just incredibly important because 
so many decisions, as we all know, have some financial implications. Uh, also, as the board makes strategic decisions, that impacts financial decisions at the day-to-day -day operations from a, from a budget standpoint, et cetera. So I think it's really important on a two-way street that, that uh, CFOs attend all board meetings. Uh, obviously, to the extent an organization has an audit and compliance committee, um, they should be uh, involved with both the audit and compliance and finance committees and uh, meet on a regular basis with the with the chairs of those committees um, to the extent there is in the case it depends on the size of the organization uh, meeting with the chief compliance internal audit uh, uh, directors are that occurs at the job your health level type organization it's not going to happen at a, at a uh, uh, De La Salle high school level um, I think it's important to have constant conversations with the external audit partners, both as the CFO and as the uh, audit and compliance chair, um, it, it, the, you just need to know from a, on an ongoing basis during audit planning, during on-site audit, obviously, and then at the time of the financial statement and management letter uh, disclosures, um, it's really, really important to stay on a, on a constant basis with the uh, external audit partner and uh, know, know where, uh, what is occurring in yeah. terms of the audit. Absolutely. And, and you know, with regards to regular, regular meetings with the audit committee chair or the finance committee chair, um, you know, if, if it wasn't audit season per se, say maybe it's budget season, well, what, are you, what are you talking about as a CFO when you talk to them? Well, I think there's, it's important to stay obviously current with any new accounting pronouncements that, that will affect uh, the organization and uh, any disclosures that will be coming out, uh, any new developments within the organization. Um, right, whether it's litigation or new financial correct. contracts or anything like that. Better to keep the auditors apprised of that as on an ongoing basis than, than uh, uh, have surprises down the way. Um, the CFO in any of these conversations needs needs to continue to provide realistic view of that organization's progress. So if it's with the external auditors, it's we've got a big litigation issue coming up or whatever it is, but sure. being realistic and, and providing that that uh, right. view to these various collection issues on pledges maybe or investment management with regards to endowment or whatever. Correct. Right. Any kind of those issues, you just kind of want to be aligned with that finance committee chair. You don't want to, I'm assuming you just don't want to, nobody likes surprises. So I'm no. assuming you just no. don't want to surprise them with it in the meeting, but you want to meet them ahead of time and say, hey, this is what's going on. And We're they may be able to this. provide that insight to use one of the key things that the board provides is insight. They may provide some insight that you as the CFO may not have considered. Perfect, perfect. Um, how do we, you know, and we kind of talked about the status of the audit or not, but um, how do we make sure that, you know, boards are asking the right questions, right? Like they're not talking about, hey, what's going to be our employee match or, you know, the benefits or the increase in benefit expense or anything like that, but really talking about um, the major issues that the that, that nonprofits are dealing with. How do you kind of direct that conversation? From the board perspective? From the CFO perspective, from talking. The talking to your finance committee? Well, I think you've got to back to raising them up to, it's really easy to get down into the details, into the weeds, and, and you've got to bring them back up into the major issues that are really con confronting that organization, whether it be investments or sure. uh, fundraising or whatever, you know, strategic roadblocks there are, uh, those are the issues that need to be discussed with the finance committee chair or with the finance committee. Got it, got it. And how have you seen, Marilyn, you know, in your time of, of, of being a CFO, how have you seen that role changed from when you, when you started to kind of when you ended? How did you see that change? Uh, I think that the CFO has become more of a business manager, more of a uh, risk manager, uh, risks continue to increase in our life uh, from 
uh, insurance type litigation risks to cyber attacks. Uh, their risk management is, is really critical. Uh, I think the CFO's role will become more strategic um, and certainly all along, and it's more so now, uh, a communicator. Um, it's really critical to be able to communicate to the various constituencies, the board, the, the committees, uh, finance and audit, uh, to be able to communicate concepts that the board, that, and issues that the organizations dealing with to these members of the board and members of these committees. Yeah, Marilyn, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, you had said that, you know, during your time as audit committee chair, John Muir, that you had a, um, was it an interim CFO? And you really appreciated how that interim CFO was able to communicate. Can you kind of well, that's just been fairly recent. And he was just made uh, permanent CFO, well, CFO uh, just this last week. Uh, he, it's ex you know he's excellent at communicating uh, concepts and financial issues to non-financial people right um, yeah in, in that organization a lot of physicians that may not have a financial background without dumbing it down without being condescending or yeah. making it you know too simple um, and making it so that it somewhat comes alive and, and they realize the importance of some of these decisions and, and are given the tools in order to make the, the appropriate decision. Awesome. Awesome. So that is something that, you know, as CFOs kind of look at their role in the organization, that if they feel like, hey, I understand all these numbers, right? Mm -hmm. I get it. I know exactly what's happening. How do I, how am I communicating them? whether it's charts and graphs or whatever you're doing to communicate, to help everybody understand this is the current scenario that we're looking at and this is where we're going to go strategically, um, that would be an important skill set for CFOs to move forward. Absolutely, whether it's through dashboards or yeah. uh, explanations or whatever it is. Okay, great, great. Um, we did talk about how the function of the CFO is changing. Also, the fact that you know we know that, that through our CFO evolution studies, here at Armenino, that CFOs are trying to be less of an accountant and more of a business leader. And um, here's where I, I kind of wanted to talk about, you know, if you're going to do less of accounting, then someone needs to do the accounting. And I know, Marilyn, that when we first started working together, um, you didn't have a controller. You were the CFO and the controller. Um, let's talk about how you moved forward um, and how, what were the discussions that you were having with your board um, in terms of finally getting a controller and what that looked like and felt like? Well, when, and I think if you look on the left side of the slide, when you uh, are doing more of the accounting, something else has to give. You're not as much of a business leader or you're not working on other strategic uh, um, issues that the organization may be facing. So, as we saw the need to provide more of that insight to the CEO, uh, we realized I needed to do a little bit less accounting. I couldn't do it all, and something had to give. I mean, yeah. either that or I was working 24 hours a day. <laughs> um, so I think that as we started realizing that and, and saw that evolution occurring, uh, we ha couldn't take the bite the budget bite in one year, so we started with a, a part-time controller and then uh, eased into a full-time controller. And it's a critical uh, part of our of the business office team uh, at at the LaSalle. I know it is, and as you get into larger organizations, there are bigger business offices and a larger controllers uh, function. But uh, I found it incredibly important and I know the CEO got more out of me as I was not doing day-to-day -day debits and credits. Right, right. And probably found you more of a, of a true partner. Correct. Right. Okay. Um, so now for that, that CFO, if they're going to elevate their role, we did already talk about attending regular meetings with senior le leadership and, and the board and committees. Um, but I also wanted to point something that you said to me is that the necessity to direct yourself to larger issues that you're addressing, not just getting, you know, financials out to department chairs, um, but really focusing in on on key issues, 
Um, how, how do you do that? Because this will also help our CFOs elevate in your organization. Well, I think one thing that that changed when we uh, got a new CEO, I think it's been eight years at, at Dulles Hall, was uh, he formed a, a senior leadership team or a, uh, his cabinet. And I think having the CFO have a role as a part of that, making all the major decisions of that organization uh, and being part of those decisions, I think that is really, really critical because it does elevate you away from not that you can't do those financials and, and those aren't important, but it does elevate you to have to direct yourself to those larger issues. Uh, and, and I think that's how it occurred. Great, great. And then now, you know, in the budgeting process, uh, we, we know that the budgets take some time at nonprofits and they're not exactly, it, it, it takes some work. How do you elevate your, your role in the budgeting process? Well, I, I think that ha absolutely has to have a strategic uh, component to it, both in the operating budget and and capital expenditure budgets. Um, and and the capital expenditure budget should be uh, getting input from from a number of constituencies in the in the organization, but it should reflect the strategy overall strategy that the board has has put together or that the senior leadership has put together depending on the size of the organization. And uh, that budgeting all the way through should reflect that same strategy. Got it, okay, all right. With that, I think that will take us to our third polling question. And how often should CFOs meet with their external audit partner um, at a minimum? So once a year, twice a year, three times a year, never, not sure. Give you guys a couple more seconds to click um, that question so everybody makes sure that they've answered question three so we get your CPE credit. All right, with that said, the answer is we recommend three times a year, um, and in, here at Armenino, we are we're big believers of of a relationship with our clients. Um, we want to talk with you, um, and I think it's it's just most beneficial for the organization to have continuous relationship and dialogue going be, back between the CFO and um, the audit partner. Um, nobody wants to be surprised, you know, we know that our clients look, don't like to be surprised and, you know, to be honest, we don't like to be surprised either. We're still accountants as well and when we get out in the field, whether it's for interim or final, we don't want to have a surprise of, oh, wow, you entered into this big agreement. We had no clue or you have this big matching grant or you have this new endowment or this new contract and we, we did had no clue about it and that's going to take a lot of work. So we definitely um, promote talking to your partner as much as possible, um, but at least three times a year. Okay, board impact. And I think this is going to be really good. How to better the board's role. Um, I think, you know, from your time as a board member at John Muir, um, you know, let's kind of just walk through the process. How do we, you know, when, when we talked about nominating committees and, and governance committees earlier um, and actively seeking out board members that would be very good for the organization. So now you get them in, they join, they're like, okay, I'm happy to be here. How do we, how do we level set with that? How do we level set and say, hey, okay, this is our organization. This is what we're looking for our board to do. How, how, do, how have you guys done that? Well, absolutely really required to have board mem new board member orientation and perhaps uh, having some uh, existing board members who just need some you know re-upping of, <laughs> of information right. but but that is meeting it, it lasted I as I recall a couple days when I started at, at John Muir I think now it's over a period of time and includes tours of facilities and and uh, meetings with various uh, people, but it's also going through financials and just introducing them to the 
to the whole uh, organization, but it's also reminding the um, senior vice president of, of governance uh, sits down and goes through their responsibilities, the bylaws, charter, what have you, as well as for each of the committees. So um, I started on a new committee this year. In my 10th year, I've been on the board 10 years, and yet I went through orientation for that committee because I'd never served on that committee before. So I think it, it never, that should never end. I mean, it's constant orientation. Um, the other thing that we have instituted there, and again, it's a larger organization, but mentoring. So having a new board member mentored by an existing board member who's had some experience uh, with that organization and, and understands some of the issues, uh, I think that's important. The uh, next bullet point, the daily, weekly email with media monitoring, I, I get that, I get daily monitoring from uh, John Muir Health, but healthcare is a constant changing uh, every day. There's something new occurring, and that's critical. So it's in a smaller organization that's not going to happen. But I would say keeping. I think the CEO in this regard, it's really critical, even in the smaller organizations, to keep them informed. If if something comes up, don't have the board members read it in the newspaper. That's never a good idea. They, yeah. they should be informed. <laughs> or the press. It. Yeah. yeah, exactly. I mean, they, they should not hear it third hand. It should come from the CEO first. And uh, so whenever issues come uh, uh, come up, they it should be uh, that the CEO should inform the board. Um, ongoing board member education sessions, depending on, uh, again, the size of the organization, but there are various... Uh, depending on the industry, uh, various board-type governance uh, classes and, and education sessions um, at, at John Muir Health. I've attended a number of them in board governance areas and also audit and compliance committee governance. And uh, we also ha internally have many retreats where we, they'll have outside speakers come in. So any way we can educate and, and keep board members informed. There's something that I, I think of, that you need to consider as you're managing boards, and that is boards are the strategic constituency, constituencies of that organization. So the more informed and more transparent you can be as with your board members, the better the, they are as a strategic asset to that organization. So it's really, really critical that you continue to keep them informed, be transparent with them, and continue to educate them in whatever the industry that it is. And remember, for even those in the smaller organizations, like Adolis Hall High School, board members come in, maybe they've been in the for-profit world, they don't know nonprofit accounting. <laughs> or they may not know all the ins and outs of a school or healthcare or whatever the industry is. The more you can inform them of those things, the better they can provide you that foresight, insight, and oversight. You know, provide you those strategic directions and give you back you being the organization. Uh, their, their best. So it's important that the board members also, uh, to the extent they need to meet with CFO or the CEO to, to understand things offline, I think that's important as well. Yeah, so did you take time um, in your role as, as CFO when, when board members were saying, hey, you know, hey, Marilyn, just want to understand what, what sure. you know, we went over something and, and, and I don't want to raise my hand in the finance committee or the audit committee, but I just don't understand something. Sure. Uh, um, financials. I mean, many of them don't understand, uh, you know, restrictions on a uh, assets and and uh, uh, what the different funds are, et cetera. And so, I would give them a little lesson. They would come and see me. So, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and and do you feel like that was another area that that kind of elevated your role in the organization is that you were able to build relationships directly with board members? Oh, absolutely. That's it's incredibly important. Great, great. 
Um, okay, well now in today's in today's world, um, we kind of wanted to talk about some of the hot the hot topics for board members. And, and you know, Marilyn, when you and I had talked, you said that, gosh, cybersecurity and and you know that's even that's on the nonprofit world, the for profit world, public companies. It doesn't matter. It seems like cybersecurity is just the number one um, issue that people are dealing with today. Would no. you agree? We we will never stay ahead of it. On the way here today, I was listening to Ted Koppel speak about, uh, he just wrote a book about cybersecurity and, and potential attacks on our uh, uh, electrical grid in this country and how we would be brought to our knees. So uh, I, I heard a talk last night or a presentation at Technology Committee at John Muir Health on cybersecurity and and what we have to do to uh, and it and it costs in our case millions to and you're never going to stay ahead of the potential threats that are out there. Um, certainly, even in the smaller organizations, yeah. we're going to face that. Um, in schools, how do you know that students aren't going to try to hack in and 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 do things? So, I think that's going to always be um, a, a number one risk that we face and and uh, how we keep the board informed of that is is challenging again I had a presentation last night as a board member but uh, I think it is something that is constantly going to be on, on the forefront of everybody's uh, minds I think that uh, obviously financial stability meeting board objectives are critical on an ongoing basis, we do at John Muir Health, and I think, you know, maybe not consciously, it is at Dulles Hall High School. Uh, we revisit a strategic plan. We we relook at strategic issues on an ongoing basis at every board meeting. It's critical. Uh, um, again, the board is your strategic thinker, so use them for that. Um, Great. And 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 have those discussions about strategic plans. Um, industry specific compliance I would say uh, there's a lot of that in the healthcare world I was going <laughs> to say that yeah I mean you, you it seems like you would almost want to you know we were talking earlier about seeking out board members and if you could seek out a board member that works in the cybersecurity space or heads up an organization that specializes in something like that, that yeah. especially with all of the you know reporting and compliance in that kind of world, that you would want to seek that person out. Absolutely. Um, yeah, in compliance, again, even the smallest of organizations have compliance issues, uh, but you want the expertise for any of these issues, and and I would think your participants today could list a number of other oh, hot topics <laughs> that are keeping them awake at night. But these were some of the uh, issues, obviously, that uh, came to our mind. But anybody, the board should be positioned to be able to discuss these issues. And so to the extent you have somebody that has background in any of these areas, uh, certainly in the IT area, um, mm -hmm. Most of us don't understand what our IT guys uh, are speaking, and uh, <laughs> so having somebody with that expertise is important. Um, Marilyn, in, in your experience, are you seeing more um, chief not, chief technology officers or IT directors? Are they still reporting to the CFO, or is that a, a, a role that now is just reporting directly to the CEO and a lot of nonprofits? Depends on the size of the organization. Um, this, the CIO to, uh, at John Muir Health reports the CEO. Um, we have hired a chief uh, information security officer, and they report uh, to through both uh, the CEO and directly to the board because of right. concerns. Uh, the same with the uh, compliance and, and internal audit have dotted lines directly to the board. So depends. Uh, but in smaller organizations, I, the CE, CIO or the mm -hmm. director of technology, whatever the title is, um, that bounces around. That's all yeah. over the place. I, I think our director of technology is reported to our uh, CEO, the CFO, and the uh, principal and <laughs> in varying different times. So I think it is an issue that people don't 
aren't sure exactly where that reporting should occur. Okay. Depends on the size of the organization, I would say. Okay. And then how, I guess, and is that an area where you would say, yeah, well, you know, if I'm a CFO out there and that IT director or, or CIO is reporting to me, um, that, you know, I would want to um, just ensure and verify that things are being done correctly. I would say that a lot of CFOs out there aren't exactly the most versed in, in IT. We actually uh, had a, and I think it's been about three years, three, four years, we had a uh, audit done by a technology, not mm -hmm. accounting audit, but a technology audit of our whole technology infrastructure and how things were going and provided us some good insight in that because we, you don't always know if you're well positioned. I think we've also had some audits, penetration audits done to mm -hmm. see whether we've got a good firewall sure. and, and protection, but uh, that's an ongoing, as I say, we'll never totally stay ahead of all of that. Right. If it just feels like that's our new reality. Correct. All right. Uh, polling question number four. Uh, we want to make sure everybody answers this question. Um, what is one of the top of mind issues for your board members? Um, cybersecurity, A, accounting updates. You know, there is, and, and we did a webinar on this earlier this year. Please feel free to revisit our website to see uh, potential changes on the, the nonprofit accounting update. Uh, industry compliance topics, D, other, or E, unsure. There is no right answer here. And for those of you, I'm just going to jump in here, Dean. For those of you answering other, um, you know, we can see um, if you can submit in the comments section sort of what those other issues are. Um, and Marilyn and Dean might be able to address them or, you know, at least verify that others may have similar issues. And yeah, we'll give a couple more seconds for the polling question to be answered so everyone can, again, get their credit. Okay. Um, other program sustainability. That's one. Fundraising, strategic plan. Um, other was was the big driver here, and then that's kind of what we thought um, that could happen. Um, so when when we say that, or other issues, expanding our target market. Um, let's see, managing growth, sustainability. Um, you know, that, that's actually a good or, good question that we can ask you real quick, Marilyn. Um, you were at, you know, you were a board member at, at John Muir, and they had a lot of growth when you were there. And you were a CFO at, at Dale Sal, and they had a lot of growth. And, and where you finished to where you started is very different. How did you help those organizations manage um, that growth period? You know, what, how did you do it from a financial or a CFO level? How did you partner with your CEO or as the audit committee chair, how did you partner with the CFO to, you know, help manage that? Oh, that's many different levels of that. But again, I, I go back to that strategic plan, developing that. Um, growth happens uh, in so many ways. It certainly didn't so much in terms of our total enrollment because we're compressed with that. But but there are a lot of financial demands on the organization. You've got to improve your facilities. You've you've got to pay your personnel, which is a big yeah, chunk we're, of Yeah, we're in the Bay Area. Right. And that's probably two-thirds of the budget, both at Dulles Hall and at Jum Your Health. So um, that payroll is a, a big driver of those costs going up. So how do you control that and at the same time become – continue to be affordable. Uh, certainly the pressures in, in the tuition area in terms of how do you control, keep that affordable because the mission again there is, is to reach out to the poor and, and sure. to be, uh, provide that education. In the healthcare world, uh, it, it's, we're constantly having uh, change there and with the Affordable Care Act we've we've uh, the drive to lower costs at the same time to lower our you know cost to the to the consumer to the patient 
is being driven down while at the same time labor costs and everything, all other costs are going up. So there is right. that constant squeeze. Um, so it is forecasting, it's budgeting, multi-year budgeting, it's, it's uh, making those strategic decisions on where best to spend those limited dollars. Right. Right. And like you said earlier, in, in case of a of a CFO who was trying to bring on that controller, it was doing it slowly. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, you slowly build that into your budget. It's really hard to get that approval for that one person right away. But it, maybe you have a role out there, whether it's in your fundraising department or it's in your finance and accounting department. Um, that you know, if, if you could prove value slowly over time, then you can start to Put that in your budget or taking that hard look and it is difficult at are all functions on the, in the organization necessary do we need to let an, you know remove another function and, yeah, and replace out. it sure for for an organization that i mean for a, a role that could have a bigger impact yes and yeah. and i see a number of the concerns are in in fundraising i think that's really critical i i know in the bay area uh Certainly over in, in uh, Silicon Valley area, we've got, in San Francisco, you've got more sophisticated donors, philanthropists, yeah. and, and uh, it seems in the East Bay, we've got, I don't know, I don't want to say less sophisticated, but certainly less uh, inclined to to donations and, and f philanthropy, and, and I think fundraising is, is challenged, especially after... Uh, the Great Recession and and uh, people are get just getting on their feet and and the last thing they're going to do is is make a donation maybe and and so that's going to constantly be a challenge but I think if an organization is well positioned in their strategic vision and they can communicate that out to the broader community. Uh, people are more willing to invest in them as donors. I mean, donors, you have to look, fundraising, you have to look at as an investment into that organization. And if they see a, an organization that's well run, that's got a vision, that's moving and is well supported by a good strong board and good strong senior leadership, you're apt to invest in that as a donor rather than an organization that doesn't have that good board governance and, and uh, good management that has that strategic does not have that strategic vision they're not going to invest in it so I think fundraising you can help that by having better board governance great that's, I think that's a, a great way to um, to end this webinar Marilyn I think um, you've provided your experience is very unique both being a CFO and being an audit committee chair and I think you've done a great job of giving that kind of value back to everybody on this webinar. So in conclusion, today we've discussed how to help your board direct versus do, uh, keeping them out of your underwear drawer per se, the importance of the CFO's role in educating the board on key financial metrics, and what CFOs can do to start making an impact on their board um, tomorrow and really um, elevating themselves in that organization. Uh, we do see some other questions, and we'll re reach out to you um, individually uh, and, and answer those. I think, you know, a good question, Dean, I just want to add one sort of to the end, kind of finish this off nicely. At the beginning, we had a couple of people say, you know, I really want to take this presentation back to my board. And, you know, maybe they're not comfortable with that. Maybe they haven't had to have those kind of discussions before. I mean, how do you suggest sort of taking this sort of back to the board um, and sort of distilling what we kind of talked about today and, and sort of easy to digest nuggets? Yeah, that's, I'm going to look at you, Marilyn. <laughs> that's a hard one. To, I don't know your specific organizations, but I think that's, again, a CEO role to take the – the CEO should go back to the board and just say, you know, I think we need to continue to, to uh, provide you background and, and, and information on best practices in board governance, and, and uh, we'd like to – uh, share this with you. Um, I don't know if you do it at a board meeting or you send this out electronically and have them do it on their time. Um, it depends on the organization and how involved those board members are. Uh, certainly, 
as a board member at John Muir Health, I spend a lot of time, uh, probably 20, 30 hours a, a month, just a, as a volunteer on, on a board. So uh, this would be part of that that time. Uh, I think if you're going to be a good board member, you're going to be a responsible board member, uh, they, they need to understand what their, their role is. Yeah. And, and really, it just comes back down to best practice and, and what are really board, really good boards doing. And like you said earlier, really good boards um, are also producing very good results. And I think Absolutely. that that's, that it all just ties back together. And, and good results that the donors are going to want to invest in, in the, that organization. Great, great. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, we do have our contact information here if you want to email us directly. Um, and we really appreciate your time today on our webinar. Thank you so much. Thank you all. And I will be emailing out the presentation again to those of you who'd like a copy. Um, as Marilyn said, to share, there'll be a recording and the PDF of the slides. So thank you again, as Dean said, for joining us. And we hope to see you at a future Armino webinar. Thank you so much.